Quiet on set. Picture is up. All right, roll sound. Rolling. Roll cameras. Cams rolling. And three, two. Hey everybody, what's going on? And welcome back to Hank's Think Tank. I've got a really interesting show for you today. Put on your thinking caps. You're going to need them. I have Dr. Nicholas Sunzef in, and he is a distinguished professor of physics and astronomy from Texas A&M University. Dr. Sunzef has an extensive career in cosmology and astronomy, which includes the discovery of the acceleration of the universe and the presence of dark energy. Him and his team, the High Z Supernova team, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics back in 2011. In addition, Dr. Sunzef has written many publications and has also been featured on his own TED Talk. Welcome aboard, Dr. Sunzef. How are you today? Thank, great. Thanks for inviting me. Not a problem. I also have Alex Brow on my left. He's going to co-host with me today. He's a really smart young man, and he's got some great questions he's going to ask Mr. Sunzef, and, and uh, I guess we can just jump right into it. So I've done a lot of research on some of the things that that you've been into and, and some of the things that you've discovered mm -hmm. still have a problem wrapping my head around a lot <laughs> of it just because it's really, really complicated. But I'd like to actually start with dark energy. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did all this come about? How did the team get formed? And, and when all this happened, were you actually looking for dark energy or did you, was there a suspicion that something existed that, that maybe hadn't been discovered before or, or was it an accident? It wasn't an accident, but we didn't expect what the result was because gravity, you throw something in the air and it slows down. And so you expect the universe to do that as it expands, you expect it to slow down because gravity sucks, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we expected to measure the deceleration of the universe. And that's one of the two important numbers to describe the, the local evolution of the universe. It's how fast it expands and how fast you're decelerating. It's like in a car, you're going down the, the road and you've got to come to a stop. You're going to going at a certain speed. You have to decelerate at a certain speed to come to a stop. The right. universe was doing the same thing, and we didn't expect that we'd see an acceleration. That things were actually speeding up. So instead of hitting the brake, we were hitting the accelerator in the universe. It does date back to Einstein. Einstein, in his theory of gravity, put in this special term, which allowed him to create a universe which was the same static for in the past and in the future because he, he knew that the universe was going to collapse on itself. So he put in an anti-gravity to keep things apart. And that anti-gravity, that term was called, is called the cosmological constant. But he immediately set it to zero afterwards because he realized that the universe actually, he didn't, he realized the universe wasn't, wasn't static, it was expanding. And so in the expansion, you don't, you don't need this term. And so he just set it equal to zero and physicists and astronomers have forgotten about it. But we did want to understand the, how fast the universe was decelerating. And because the faster the deceleration, the more mass there is in the universe. So mm -hmm. by measuring how fast things are slowing down, we also measure how much stuff there is in the universe. So that's what we were trying to do. We were measuring the expansion rate and also the deceleration rate. But we found that the sign was the opposite on the accelerate. It was acceleration. Well, wow. and you did this by studying a supernova, right? Yeah, supernovae are just kind of like lighthouses. We know how bright they are, by then by measuring how faint they are in the sky, we can figure out how far they are away. It's like car lights in the distance. You know okay. how far away the car is based on how bright the lights are. Right. And so my earlier team learned how to calibrate exploding stars, which is what we were using. And once we knew how to how bright intrinsically the exploding star was, because these things get, get can get up to the brightness of a whole galaxy, a billion stars, we can see them all the way across the universe. And so you could now have these signposts backwards in time because things that we see in the distance, it took a long time for light to get to us. So we're really looking backwards in time. We're able to have these light posts to measure the deceleration of the universe. Because the universe had to be expanding faster in the past because gravity is slowing it down. Mm -hmm. what, we didn't find, what we didn't expect was that locally in the last four billion years or so, the universe is accelerating in the opposite direction. So it was slowing down originally and now it's speeding up. Wow. Okay. I'm really trying to comprehend that. So when you say look backwards in time, mm -hmm. you don't really mean that we're looking at the past, right? Or, or are we looking oh, at yeah. the past? I mean, 
This and that's because of the speed of light. Yeah, this is about a foot, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes a billionth of a second for light to travel a foot. Right. So you're about four or five feet away from me. So I'm seeing you as you were in the past. It's only five billionth of a second in the past. But what I see is not you right now. It's what you were in the past. That's scary. And you're even farther <laughs> in the past. <laughs> and well. So, and so, so as we look out into the universe, at, at things that are at great distances, then we really are seeing hundreds, billions, millions of years in the past. Right. Those galaxies are, are the age they are today. Everything's the same age in the universe. It's about 14 billion years. Mm -hmm. But the light that we're seeing took a long time to get to us. So we're seeing things as they were in the past. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Wow. How? That's weird. So when you tell somebody to stop living in the past, <laughs> <laughs> they can't. They can't if they're far <laughs> away. <Yeah. laughs> they can't if they're just an inch from you. Yeah. you know? So, wow. That's cool. So what'd you have, Alex? Um, I was going to ask, uh, if things are accelerating forward, how can you tell where their current state was, if that makes sense? You can't. Um, you can, we can measure everything about the universe locally, how much matter there is, how much dark energy, but we really don't know what's, what's, what can happen in the future. So again, mm -hmm. all the galaxies in the universe, everything in the universe is the same age right now. The Big Bang was about 13.8 billion years ago. Right. But we can't see that. The, the distant stuff is still very, very, that light is still coming towards us. And so maybe in the future, there's some weird instability of some energy field that causes the universe to go into some weird state and suddenly the universe just doesn't exist anymore. Or did, you get a Big Bang happening again. Um, I can't say that's going to happen until that light gets to us. So I can't really, I can predict the future based on what I know right now. But there are things in physics that could change over time that I can't predict at this point. So it's only a, a very rough extrapolation into the future of what's, what's, what's going to happen. So we only know where things were, not where they currently are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I know. That's trippy. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to wrap your head around that, but, but it does make sense. Mm -hmm. that, that's incredible. Well, if you're looking at fireworks, you know, it goes up in the sky and you have this thing that explodes. If you didn't see where it ex the explosion, you can figure out where it was just by the fact that everything's moving away from it, from that certain point. And so it's kind of the same with cosmology. We can see in the past and we can figure out where stuff was, but what's going to happen in the future, we can predict it, but we're ne not going to know for sure until it actually happens. Hmm. How, how are we able to figure out the, because you're saying the universe is accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. You know the rate at which it's, it's accelerating? Yeah. How do you know that? Or or how do you measure it, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, if you're in a car, how do you, how would you measure your acceleration? It's you know, it's a certain speed, and then a couple of seconds later, you're going a little bit faster, and a couple of seconds later, faster. It's your change in speed over time. Well, looking backwards in time, I can measure the change in speed of how, fa how fast galaxies appear to be moving away from us. I see. And that's the, so it's a direct measure of acceleration. It's because we're seeing a change in velocity of the expansion of the universe. So if the universe is infinite. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, I, but we do believe it's finite, right? Oh, the, the universe we can see is finite because you can only see as far as the age of the universe. Okay. I'm, almost certainly there's stuff beyond it, but that light hasn't had a chance to get to us yet. So right. our universe, the observable universe, is expanding into something that's bigger. And that bigger thing, we don't know the extent of. I can tell you what the minimum size of it is, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you whether it's infinite or not infinite. Wow. So mm -hmm. theoretically, though, there could be an end. Yeah, theoretically, but that would be weird. But yeah, why not? Be weird because what would happen <laughs> yeah. at the end? Yeah, but you know? everything in this is weird, right? So yeah, yeah. It, it if really you, is. If you think about it, our ability to th to understand that there's a there's a nature to the universe that's understandable that's that's one of the weirdest things that we can actually look out at the universe and think we can understand what's out there and that that simple thought sometimes just completely discombobulates my mind when i'm thinking about cosmology it's like why is it we can do that right you know, yeah why does yeah. mathematics work yes. same same idea right and you know I'm, i've always been kind of perplexed on that there's an actual difference between theology and science it almost seems like they will eventually converge because for instance 
if if all this started with the Big Bang, then what was there to produce the Big Bang, and where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And will we ever be able to get all the way to that to find out that information? Well, actually, we know what happened before the Big Bang. We do. The Big okay. Bang is is a epoch in the universe, which starts our universe into expansion. But we have a pretty good theory about what happened before it, and we okay. actually have some evidence of what happened before the Big Bang that set up this incredibly dense, hot thing out of which we see our universe. It's, it's a theory called inflation. But then that inflation universe, you know, does it exist inside another universe? Is it kind of, you know, onion shells or turtles wow. on top of turtles? We can mm -hmm. only push back three universes. We have three universes we talk about. The observable universe, which is everything we can see. We're expanding into something that's bigger, which is the Big Bang universe. And then that, in theory of inflation, can be created by some other process, which we have some evidence for. Okay. Hmm. And are we speaking of parallel universes, possibly? Or, or does that just state the parallel universes? That's a tricky question. The parallel universes people hear about are from something called string theory. Okay. And string theory is a beautiful mathematical theory that is irrelevant to our universe. <laughs> it's, it's a mathematical toy because the, the theory of of unifying all the forces of nature into a single mathematical equation is so difficult that they're not able to do that with the parameters we see in our universe. Right. So they create a simple toy universe, which is easier for them to manipulate. Okay. And in that toy universe, they create parallel universes. That's what, if you go on a blog and you listen to Brian Greene or Neil deGrasse Tyson, someone mm -hmm. like that, they'll be talking about those parallel universes. But there are parallel universes in our real universe, which is like our Big Bang. Now imagine a, our Big Bang is like a, a bubble. And our bubble, the Big Bang bubble, is expanding outwards. But there are other bubbles elsewhere that are not touching us at this point that also came out of nothing or came out of an energy field that's called the inflation field. Okay. And so those bubbles themselves are separate universes at this point. So those are parallel wow. universes in our theory of cosmology as we observe it with telescopes. Okay. Whereas the multiverse, the stuff you hear from the string theorists, that's all really cool stuff, but it's not, it, and it may in the end be incorporated in our understanding of our universe, but right now it's a mathematical model, a okay. toy model for them to try to understand the basic laws of, of unifying all the forces of nature together into a single equation. Okay. So those other bubble universes that you just spoke of, and those are already observable, correct? No, no, those aren't they're, observed. They're not. We can only observe what's in our universe. Okay. But, but we, you know they're there. No, we think they're there. I mean, okay. I, the fact that if this theory describes our universe, our Big Bang universe, mm -hmm. then by the laws of physics, these other universes, these other bubbles must exist. Okay. Um, but that's not proof. That's, that's consistency theory. with our theory. Right. We okay. can actually never see the other universes except in one sense. If our bubble happens to be next to another bubble you know, you know when you're a kid and you're blowing bubbles you know mm -hmm. some, sometimes they stick together right if you look at where they stick together they form a perfect circle where right they stick together well the same thing would happen with our universe and another one that's nearby if it was so close and both of these expanded and started touching each other they're like two bubbles and we would see a circle in the sky what that circle would be i don't wow. know and it could be that you know you're looking into another universe maybe the laws of physics are different there you know who knows but we would see a circle so, you know, like there's a light up here behind you, which is a perfect circle. Right. So when we map out the sky and talk about, look at the early universe, we look for circles because those would be indications of a previous black hole or, or us touching another universe. Mm -hmm. So I wonder wow. what that would do to our laws of physics if those two converged. That's a good question. Wow. <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of weird <clears throat> things about a universe. I guess the question that I was <clears throat> attempting to get to mm -hmm. was... If those other bubbles or those other universes existed, would the same elements possibly come together that would create life in another place? I mean, yes, do you think it, that's possible? It's possible, but it's because we know so little about the whole process. It's mm -hmm. it's possible that in these other other universes, forget about the multiverse, these other universes, maybe the laws of physics are different. Maybe gravity is different or the mass mm -hmm. of the electron is different or the charge of the electron is a little different. If you change any of those by a fraction of a percent, 
things can't happen like they happen in our universe. Right. So we are fine-tuned, which is something that actually comes into theology a lot. Took a miracle yeah, to make it happen. Yeah. In a sense that it's a miracle that we're here. On the other hand, if that miracle didn't happen, we would not be here to ask the question, why did this miracle happen? Right. <laughs> so, so we're statistics of one, so it's hard to it's hard to use our existence to prove the existence of anything else. Right. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Alex, you have any others? I know yeah, you had a couple I actually, other questions. I actually heard you <clears throat> talk about this, but I would be interest, interested for you to expand on it. Um, I heard about with the universe expanding, the galaxies are getting further and further away from each other to the mm -hmm. point that they reach a certain event horizon yep. mm -hmm. and the light can't reach us anymore. Do mm -hmm. you mind talking about that? I find that really interesting. Yeah, it took me a long time to get my mind around this. And what I'm going to say, not all cosmologists will agree with me. That's the cool okay. thing about cosmology. We don't all agree with each I like other. It. A lot <laughs> yeah. stuff. So, That's beautiful. So when I look at you know, a car moving away from me, it's actually moving. It's got a kinetic energy. If it runs into something, someone's going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. So that's a kinetic energy we say in physics. In the universe, things that the galaxies that are moving away from each other really are not moving. What's happening is the universe is stretching. And it sounds like I'm splitting hairs here, which for someone like me is not a good <coughs> idea because I don't have much of, the, much of those to split. But the, the, the fact that the universe is stretching as opposed to things moving means that the stretching can actually appear faster than the speed of light. Because nothing can go faster than the speed of light if you try to push it. Mm -hmm. But in general relativity, you can have space stretch because there's no energy involved in it. And so the, you can have the stretching process that make the galaxies go faster and faster away from each other. And in some sense, the galaxies over time will appear to be going faster than the speed of light. And if they're going faster than the speed of light, that light will never get to us and they disappear from our vision of the universe. A little more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it is. So the acceleration in the universe will cause over time <clears throat> the distant galaxies to disappear. And then the near, more nearby galaxies disappear until pretty much the night sky is dark. Wow. And that actually reminds me of the point you made about the, the fact that there is blackness in the sky is kind of evidence that the universe may be finite. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you connect that to the idea that things could maybe reach that event horizon? Because oh, no, no, that that idea is much more simple than that. The fact that um, that the night sky is black. Well, you know, I'm, I can look out the window here, and you've got a lot, bunch of trees around, and the forest is dense enough that I don't see much sky, but I can see a few patches of sky in the distance. Mm -hmm. If you are trees, more trees in the, in the background, sooner or later there wouldn't be any clear spots. Everywhere I would look there would be a tree. So the same is in the universe. If the universe was infinite, then in any direction in the sky I would, should be able to see a star. No matter where I look, there should be a star because it's infinite. Mm -hmm. And But if there's a star in every direction, the stars on the average are about 6,000 degrees. And so if every direction I look at there's a star, every direction should be the same temperature roughly as the sun, 6,000 degrees. Mm -hmm. So when the sun goes down, it doesn't get dark because everything in the sky is the same temperature as the sun. But that's not true. I mean, it, when the sun goes down, it gets dark, obviously. Right. Which means that there's something that's finite in the universe. Because it was infinite, it would be bright everywhere. But the fact that it's dark between the galaxies means something is finite. The age is finite, the size is finite, um, something is finite. So that simple fact that when the sun goes down it gets dark is the most profound observation you can make in cosmology. Because that shows that in some sense the universe is finite. And what's cool is the guy that sort of worked out the mathematics first was Edgar Allan Poe. You know, really? The master of darkness. He was Edgar interested. Allan Poe. Yeah, he was a poet. He was a poet, but he was also a brilliant mathematician. Really, he was really a difficult person to be with. He was kicked out of Annapolis. He was kicked out of various universities um, over time. But he was a really smart guy, and yeah. he knew mathematics. And so, in one of his publications called Eureka, he shows the mathematics of why the blackness of the sky points to the fact that something is finite in our universe. Hmm. I, I think that's cool. I'll have to I, look that yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, great. Now I've got an Edgar Allan Poe I have to look at. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have enough. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about Starlink. Okay. Um, you know, Elon Musk project. And uh, the reason why is because in your TED Talk, you had talked a little bit about space junk and had shown 
a, a pretty good map of how much space junk's already out there. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that cosmologists have concerns about collisions and things like that, and and just our observation is going to get obscured. Mm -hmm. by, so, what are your thoughts on Starlink, and do you think it's important enough to have worldwide connectivity in this manner, or bad idea, good idea? And I, you know, I don't want to badmouth Elon Musk because he's got some pretty good attorneys but <laughs> but at the same time you know i have my questions and concerns as well mm -hmm. because i don't want to pollute everything and mm -hmm. i know we've already polluted our planet and i don't think we need to pollute space yeah so well if you ask the, the typical astronomer about starlink and the constellations you know they're they're up in arms it's mm -hmm. like this is going to destroy astronomy i'm sorry to my community but that's not true it's not okay. going to destroy astronomy it's a pain in the butt but <laughs> Um, the the satellites will only be bright at dusk and at dawn. Okay. And during the middle of the night, or if you're in the north, where the sun can reflect off of the satellites, then it's going to be bad. But in where the places we have telescopes, most of the night the satellites are going to be dark enough that they don't matter. And Elon Musk and other of the people that are building these constellation satellites are very aware of the effect they have on astronomy. So they're attempting to make them as black as possible. Okay. So it's a pain in the butt. But if we know the orbits of all of the, the satellites, and there are going to be 100,000 of them within, by the yeah, end of the Yeah, I think uh, I got some stats on that. Um, 30,000 to supplement the 12,000 that are already um, been approved by the FCC. So, I mean, that's 42,000 in operation in 29 countries. Yeah. So if so. I point a telescope at a certain part of the sky, mm -hmm. I know the orbits of all these satellites. They're listed in a, in a, a database. Mm -hmm. I know exactly when it's going to cross through my field if I'm taking an image of something in that part of the sky. Okay. So I can anticipate if there's some, going to be something bright there, in which case I just go off somewhere else and look. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a concerning, and but what really concerns me are not the, the Starlink satellites. I think connectivity is really important okay. across the world. Um, you know, there are real downsides to what internet has done to us. Oh, we, absolutely. We're talking 100%. about polarization. <laughs> sure. But it's important that everyone have access to it that wants it. So I think what these entrepreneurs are doing is great. So okay. I'm actually a supporter of, of them. You know, I'm going to get a lot of <laughs> comments from my friends in the astronomical community for saying <laughs> that, but I think it, it's important. But what isn't important are space billboards. Because yeah, these, that's wow. Yes. I mean, I never even considered that concept yeah. until I saw it on your TED talk. So yeah. let, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, the the idea in space billboards is kind of like the, the Goodyear blimp. You know, that mm -hmm. it's got this little thing on the side, and this the sign goes by advertising something or Goodyear right. or whatever. You can do the same thing in space, and uh, having active LEDs lights that are powered mm -hmm. by solar panels. So, and you could it only takes something about a kilometer kilometer to a couple kilometers across to appear large enough in the sky for you to see what it what it is a, a word or a letter or, okay. or colors so these are already being planned <clears throat> they're already being built they're going oh, to really? be launched and they some of them are going to be constellations satellites that aren't touching each other but are but are flying in formation mm -hmm. other ones will perhaps be mechanically tied together I, they're, wow. they're not and programmable from Earth, so oh, they can absolutely. change the message if they want. Yeah, to. you know, so as it goes over the United States, it may say Chick Fil A, Fil A, and when it goes over <laughs> Germany, it'll say Alda Markets or something. So yeah. yeah, you reprogram it, or it could be political signs, or um, you know, it could be a, a cross for Christians. It could That's be a, a, whatever it is you want. Yeah. But there's no law that stops this. The U.S. has a law which regulates it. But mm -hmm. if you're an entrepreneur and you want to build space billboards, just go to another, you develop it here, you, you launch it in another country, and that's no problem. So active lights in the sky, that's horrible. Yeah, and it seems like it'd have yeah. to be pretty bright, too. And, and, and I, I don't know what distance yeah. they would be, but it seems like it'd have to be really bright. A few, 100, 120 miles or so. Yeah. Wow. But it's arrogant of us to think that we should be able, we could do that because we're not the only ones that look at the sky or western civilization or advertising this mm -hmm. all of humanity looks at the sky right and so there are there are cultures like the aborigines in australia who worship the sky and you know now they're going to see a texaco star going overhead <laughs> It's like a Burger King that, moon. Yeah, Burger really, King yeah. <laughs> yeah that really is arrogant yeah that's horrible so it's going to happen mm. and no one is stopping it and so in my community, the astronomers are always talking about Starlink and how it's going to destroy astronomy. It's like, right. yeah, it's going to affect us, but that's not the real problem that's coming up, guys. It's space billboards. Yeah. 
And you said yeah. they're already being developed? They're being, yeah, already being, you, there, there's a, there was a company in Russia, I don't know what's happening in Russia right now, but there was a company, advertising company in Russia that had, um, I think it had an office in San Francisco, and they contacted astronomical community a while ago to find out not our opinion of space billboards because they knew what we we're going to say, mm -hmm. but the idea was that well, if we put up a space billboard, <coughs> but we let you use this as a, a place you could put some sort of telescope on the other side, so mm -hmm. the space billboard looks down, use the other side, scope looks out, and we'll give you a billion dollars or whatever the number was. Uh -huh. Would you be interested? Wow. And so obviously we weren't. The right. United Nations was going to launch this. I think it was called the Star of Peace, so that there'd be this bright object that would orbit around the Earth and you'd look up there and you'd see this bright object and you'd think, ah, peace. You're like, no, it's just going to be... It's a, not good. A, no, it's going to be an annoying bright star that goes overhead. On one end, it sounds really cool, but on the other end, I see that being a slippery slope a little bit. Oh, it is really cool. Have you seen the constellations at, do at, at dusk or at dawn? I mean, I, you, all these, 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 there's like a line of 50 of them that's going through the sky. It's absolutely awesome to see. I've been to Big Bend once. I've seen a good good star show there but here i don't really see it i live in houston yeah it's so still too yeah, it's still too light <laughs> even out here it used to be dark enough here yeah. to be able to catch that but now yeah there's so much light yeah. pollution it's it's crazy mm -hmm. you know just and that's just due to growth you know it's almost sad and that's that's light pollution the other thing is 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 light is part of an electromagnetic spectrum which is radio which is what we're talking about here mm -hmm. is also being affected because not because of Starlink per se, but as you require more and more bandwidth for in, for communications across the world for connectivity, there's only a certain amount of bandwidth wavelengths in the radio spectrum, right. and they're apportioned by an international organization, and a few of them have been reserved for astronomers, and we we keep those quiet so we can look out into the universe. You know, we don't want to look out in the FM radio band because it's really loud. <laughs> yeah. But there are a few places. And so those places are getting squeezed by <clears throat> companies that want to use that bandwidth in order to provide international communication. And again, it's a good idea. For the radio astronomers, it's actually more critical mm -hmm. because a small amount of interference totally wipes out their ability to see the sky. Right. So right now, the radio astronomers around the world are in discussion with telecommunications companies and the government agencies that control it to try to protect these these bandwidths. Maybe not keep the bandwidths completely clean. Maybe you could say, um, you know, we'll use the bandwidth from this time to this time, and you can use it for this five minutes during the during a certain period. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of sharing it as opposed to keeping it completely clean. And so people are talking about that. But all things considered, the radio astronomers want them clean and not shared. Okay. Are any of those being used to just send out a signal constantly looking for a response? You see, yeah, some, some places are doing that. That's a, mm -hmm. a good question as to whether it's a good idea or not. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure that it is because I don't know what the response would yeah. be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And so, and so like, if... If it, what would, it, what would a positive response would be? It would like, yeah, we know there's life elsewhere in the universe, intelligent life. That's a cool thing, but it's mm -hmm. like, okay. But if that intelligent life is wants to destroy us, that's a really bad thing. So you, yeah, you that, weigh the two that and it's be like, good. like, you don't <clears throat> want to risk too much. So we, we can't stop people from seeing us because our radio signals are going out anyway. Mm -hmm. But actively communicating precise positions of where we are, I don't think that's a good idea. Probably not. Yeah. So do you think there's life elsewhere? Well, certainly there is some life elsewhere. We, we, we know there's life on the moon and Mars because no matter how well we sterilize a spacecraft, bacteria get right. along with it. So NASA's really careful, and actually all space agencies, to sterilize as well as they can the spacecraft. Um, there's a controversial measurement that the Russians made where they they landed on the moon, took a piece of an old lander, brought it back to Earth, discovered there was bacteria that had survived in the vacuum of space. Wow. It's, um, people argue as to whether the, the experiment was sterile enough, but let, let's assume it was right. So we have the, we have, we're beginning to, to populate our solar system with life, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Whether there's life outside of our solar system, it's really hard to say. It's, it's, Emotionally, you want to say yes, mm -hmm. but from a science point of view, 
We just don't have all the numbers yet to say it is. Um, right. But, okay, so life started on here on Earth really soon after Earth formed. Earth was a horrible place. It, comets were banging down on the Earth, meteors, there were volcanoes everywhere, and yet life started forming. So it formed right. under really hostile conditions very quickly on Earth. So that seems like it's a pretty good template for saying that other places, life probably started rapidly too. The question though is, why don't we have any evidence here on Earth that life formed twice? So we, we all, of, all of us, we all come from the same tree of, uh, same family tree right. of life. Why isn't there a separate family tree somewhere here on Earth if life is that easy to form? You know, maybe our life kills mm -hmm. that life form. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So one of the, the cool things to try to study for life elsewhere in the universe is here looking on Earth and looking down underneath the oceans. Because underneath the ocean, underneath the seabed, mm -hmm. it's teeming with life. Perhaps up to half of the mass of life on the Earth is underneath the ocean, and we don't know about it. Right. Yeah, it hasn't and been discovered yet. hasn't been discovered. And it, when they do these coring samples that, uh, that there's there's a international, what is it called, the integrated drilling program that Texas A&M runs, but it's run for the whole world. They take cores and they bring them up, and they were interested in how the plates, plate tectonics spread. But when they brought them up, they found that it was teeming with life. And so now biologists are looking into what's under the, the ocean floor and maybe there they will find something that it looks like a totally different family tree of life and wow. if that's the case then we know life is everywhere in the universe because so long as it so long as there's only one evidence of one place which is us mm -hmm. it's hard to use that to say that life is possible <coughs> elsewhere in the universe but if it happens twice here then life is all over the universe wow so what do you think of the story of Bob Lazar? I mean, he's got a, he's got a pretty sensational story, and it's interesting. I think the most interesting part of it is Element 115 and the possibility that there could be an anti-gravity drive, I guess is what, what he's describing, which sounds, to a layman, reasonable. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Well, good for him. Um, <laughs> if, if he thinks that That's great. this is, if he, I, I don't want to discourage anyone. Not that I'm can discourage them, discourage anyone <clears throat> from being creative and inventive. Mm -hmm. But you, at some point, have to prove to the world that your ideas are real. Right. And the idea that there is another element—that's crazy. I mean, nuclear physics doesn't allow that. Um, but does an element one fifteen exist? By now, I have no idea. We're up to near there, but, but, because what I've heard that it, it did, we were able to produce it, just not, um, in which it wasn't um, stable. Yeah, it, they'll they'll disappear in a fraction of a second. Right. But there are certain in the nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. Mm -hmm. If you add that, both of those up, that's called the atomic number of the nucleus. Right. There are certain atomic numbers which are very stable, and so there are higher numbers than one fifteen that may have a level of stability. And we haven't reached those those elements yet. Okay. Presumably they will also decay quickly, but we don't know. But anti-gravity drives, you know, go ahead and try it. But the laws of physics as we know it right now don't allow for that. Okay. But, but science does is not truth. Science is approximating nature. Right. And so if you have an idea that you think is possible, then, you know, go for it. So, and only because I don't know, I've got to ask. <laughs> so if, if they ever did develop an anti-gravity anti drive, would that be able to defeat the problem of time travel? Because in, in, from what I can tell, in an anti-gravity drive, you would basically create your own universe, so to speak, that would follow you everywhere. You wouldn't even feel the effects of, of motion and things like that. So it seems like you'd be able to defeat the whole time problem and be able to travel maybe not in excess of the speed of light, but in excess or at the speed of light. Yeah, there, there are certain problems with that, but okay. let me ex explain one of the problems. Is so also in the situation, time has a tendency to slow down according to general relativity. Right. So imagine you have a bubble over here that is some sort of anti-gravity drive and somehow you're able to enter this and go somewhere. Well, 
you enter this and your chances are you're now in, a, in an area where time is slowed down because it allows you to go anywhere in the universe very quickly. Mm -hmm. So why not get in this bubble and just go on a short trip and come back to where you started from, except now you're looking at the bubble that you started with. So now you're, you're since you're talk, since your, your time is slowed down, you can actually look backwards in time and you can see yourself entering the bubble that took you to this place. And so now you see yourself entering it. And so now you, you do the same thing. You enter the bubble and you go around and now you see two people entering it. And so you end up with this conundrum that you can wow. see yourself. Yeah, it creates a paradox. Yeah, so see yourself over and over again. And I can't say there's a law of wow. physics against that, but it's just that is so totally weird to I can't imagine how this would work. Right. Yeah. I haven't thought of it in those terms. Me neither. Yeah. But it's not against yeah. the law of physics per se, but you end up with paradoxes that Well, did you see the movie Interstellar? Was, Actually I mm -hmm. missed that one. Oh. But I'm gonna watch it now. Okay. <laughs> it's a great movie. Yeah. Well yeah. I don't know what how what you you thought, but I, I went to the movie and I was all excited about it and I left the movie and I thought, God, this was lame. The ending was the ending. very it wasn't that the one <laughs> yeah. with, uh, what's his name in it? What, what was Matthew it? McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey yeah. and, okay. and Anne Hathaway. And so at the very end, he falls into a black hole, and he's trying to communicate with his daughter, but backwards in time. And so you're in this kind of what's called a tesseract, a four-dimensional cube in the movie. Okay. And he's he sees the library in which his daughter enters, and he can see her enter at different times. And for some reason, the, the moot, this is artistic license. He can push books off the bookshelf to or knock things over and can communicate with her. Okay, so that's so. I, when I when I saw that and I, I thought like this is this just can't be. This is really stupid. Who thought this up? You know, it's a typical Hollywood movie that doesn't have <laughs> have any any scientific meaning. Well, it turns out the that's person Hollywood. That thought, the person who thought it up won the Nobel Prize two years ago is Kip Thorne, and it's his ideas that actually are true in that movie and not pushing books but let me explain it this way so in in um in our physics we we say we we need four dimensions we have three dimensions of space x y and z right and then there's this dimension of time and but they're not the same same it's like yeah it's four dimensions but these three dimensions are different than this dimension mm -hmm. space is really different than time because well for one thing I have free will in these directions. I can move, you know, this way, this way, and this way, provided I don't go faster than the speed of light. But over here, time, I can't move. I just follow along with it in the present. So I'm stuck at one point in time, always, for my whole life, which is called the present. Right. So I have no free will to move back and forth. But if you fall into a black hole, and that black hole happens to be spinning, then these three coordinates, X, Y, and Z, begin to rotate in four dimensions, and the time coordinate also rotates in four dimensions, and they begin to combine. And inside a spinning black hole, each one of the X, Y, and Z directions allow you to travel a little bit back and forth in time. And in the time dimension, the time dimension allows you to jump back and forth in space a little bit. So in that movie, what was shown at the very end actually is what is predicted for a black hole, if you fall into a black hole. Okay. So that was and you really survive. And, well, yeah, that, that's <laughs> yeah. another problem. <laughs> um, yeah, that 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 sort of black hole you wouldn't survive if you fall, fell into it. But a really big one, if you fall into it, you could survive. So okay. there actually could be civilizations in inside very large black holes. Um, so so time rotates into a little bit into space inside a black hole, and so now you can move backwards and forwards in time, which means that he could communicate with his daughter somehow by pushing books. Wow. Okay, now I've got to see that movie. So, so, what did you think when they said the missing component was love? <laughs> it's great. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not going to see that movie. <laughs> wow. Is that also backed by science? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we've already covered uh, Hubble's. Well, we covered Hubble's law, didn't we? Pretty well, much? Yeah. yeah, sort of, yeah. Yeah, okay. But you, you let, can I talk about love just for a minute? Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> you were asking me questions about religion and science. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was born and raised a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. Not probably your church. But my, my family is Russian, so I was raised in the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay. But I don't see any problem between science and religion existing in parallel. Because science 
and this dates back to Plato, science does not attempt to, to create truth. It attempts to describe reality. And so science can describe reality in experiments, in statistics, but it's got a very limited scope of what it can describe at this point. So, you know, love is outside of it. Both my parents were social workers and you would never use physics to work in social work. It's just laws of physics are irrelevant. You use a whole other vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So I look at religion and science and a number of other ways of thinking as stories of our, of our existence, of our universe. And those stories give us different things that are we need for life. And science is one of them. It's extremely powerful because it's self-correcting. Most stories about the universe are not self-correcting. Right. They give it to you. This is the way it is because that's what someone taught, taught you. In science, no. Science is constantly changing. So it means we're approaching maybe a truth, but we actually never get to that truth. And that's there's a thing called the parable of the caves by Plato, mm -hmm. where, where there's a, a wall and people are chained to the wall and they can see a wall across from them, but all they can see are shadows. And the shadows are being projected because there's the reality is behind you and there's a fire. And that fire, the, so the giraffes and the people and all that are, you see the shadows and you begin to think that's your reality, the shadows. Okay. But the real reality is behind you. But you can live in your universe looking just at the shadows. And that's sort of what we do, that, that in, in science, we're looking at the shadows. We don't know what the absolute truth is because we, we can't know the absolute truth in science. The truth for many people comes from their spirituality, their religion. But that's a different way of approaching the universe than science does. And so I, I use the word that they're stories, and that sounds kind of negative, but I don't mean it to be No, negative. I like it. I like it. And, I, and actually, Jordan Peterson has used that before as well in a lot of his speeches. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I understand that. That because, makes sense. Because it would be crazy for me to, to, to live just looking at the laws of physics. I mean, I couldn't mm -hmm. have a wife or a kid or enjoy myself or have rum tasting. Um, right. That's not described by the laws of physics. Um, but the laws of physics, the science that we do do, is very powerful because it helps our lives, it expands our, our knowledge, but it's only an incomplete view of the universe. Because there's another view of the universe with another language, or there are many, use, many use, views, and one of them is religion. And all humanity has a type of religion. It's something inherent to us. So it's mm -hmm. necessary for all of us to have that story also. And so, you know, as Christians, we have the story of what's in the New Testament. Um, and there's also the Quran, there's also the Old Testament. Right. All of those things are ways of describing the universe with a different meaning to that story. Mm -hmm. But they're necessary for us to be human beings. I like it. That's great. Yeah, that's really good. That's the first time I think it's ever been explained to me that way. So that does make a lot of sense. So because there's always been an argument between the existence of both. It's either this or that. And, and your explanation was, well, there's both. There's both. Now, it makes sense. Now, there are all sorts of subtleties. I mean, for instance, Thomas Jefferson didn't like the miracles in the Bible, so he crossed out the miracles. Mm -hmm. And so as a scientist, you read some of those miracles, it's like, yeah, the sun didn't really stop in the sky. <laughs> right. That's, sorry, that's not going to happen. So you think of that as a metaphor, as someone was describing it metaphorically. Um, so that's where the a lot of the arguments are. They'll say, ah, there's an error in the Bible, so mm -hmm. the Bible's wrong. It's like, no, not really. The Bible is this book, and this book somehow came to us. There could be mistakes. Maybe there aren't. Maybe there are, but it's not what the Bible is trying to tell you. It's the Bible is telling you something else about the universe. It's not telling you about science. And so you find a mistake. It's like, yeah, that tells you a bit of the history of the Bible, but it doesn't make the Bible incorrect. Mm -hmm. But a lot of a lot of scientists are atheists or agnostics, right? And you know, I think most people are in the, in the end are agnostic because they really don't know whether there is a god or mm -hmm. not. Because you're thinking of it as a scientist in, in Western thought, like what proof is there? But that's not the way you should be looking at it. It's like, do I need this for, for me to live my life as the best way possible? And the answer is yes, you need that. And so, in that sense, yes, there is a god. It's how you define that God, how you write it down, describe it to other people. Right. But here's yeah, something to give you the basis of morality. But he or she is there in, the, in a real sense because you're living part of your life on it. Wow. I like that. I've heard I've uh, got some people I'm going to have to get watch that part. So that's <laughs> great. 
Go ahead, Alex. I've heard an interesting comparison before between science and uh, religion or even just that, that type of thinking. Mm-hmm. And that it's, you can kind of think of a kid, like if you're trying to tell a kid to be brave at school or something like that, if he's getting bullied, um, you wouldn't tell him all of the mechanics of being brave and all the ones and zeros of how to act. You would just tell him, like, be like Batman something. And, and that sort of sums it up in the essence of it and so that's how I've after listening to Jordan Peterson that's how I kind of view religion it's sort of a it's a way to orient yourself not necessarily a scientific account for how the universe is created and how it operates it's more of a a narrative to follow not a way a way for you to find yourself in this place and time hmm. yeah that makes sense but it's a narrative that's shared across the world among all <coughs> cultures. It's like you know, right. we have a particular view of our religion, but other religions have much of the same tenets as our religion. So something there's something fundamental about those ideas which are not physical law, but they are part of our humanity. Right. And, and it's common across basically all cultures. Even when they're separated, too. And separated. And yeah. there are funny things about the, the, the almost everyone looks up to the sky as that that's where the good gods are. Right. No one, pretty much no one looks up to the sky and say, geez, that, that's where the devil lives. You know, <laughs> right. Bad stuff is going to happen there. So why is that? I, I can't explain that, but that's, a, that's something that's shared also across religions um, across the world, that the sky is something sacred, which is why we don't want space billboards. Because it's sacred. <laughs> Makes sense Comes to full me. circle. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What do you think the most fascinating thing you've ever either discovered or learned is in regards to science, astronomy, cosmology? If there could be one thing. To me, the, I would say the, the most profound thing, well, (laughs) I have to choose one, huh? Well, you don't have to (laughs) choose one. Um, The thing that, that always leaps to my mind if I think about it, but it may not be the one that I would choose, is we understand where all the elements come from. Mm -hmm. All hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, we can explain where the whole periodic table comes from. I know where gold comes from, I know where platinum comes from, I know how all of that is produced. So the mystery of what things are made of, which was alchemy Mm -hmm. many, many centuries ago, we now know where all that came from. And we now take it for granted in astronomy. Oh yeah, this iron, that pr- produced an exploding star, or fluorine, that's produced in a weird thing called a nova. Um, so we know where all of this comes from, and so we're so used to the fact that we don't think it's surprising anymore. But it is. It we, really is. We can describe where all of the elements came from. Mm-hmm. We've come so far in such a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. It's almost scary, you know? And I wonder where we'll go from here. Yeah, how long is our civilization going to last? <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good, and I, I often wonder if, if we'll be the, the reason for the destruction of it. You know, I hope not, but it sure, there are a lot of indicators that point that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So is there anything that you're working on presently that you're able to discuss? Um, well, I'm, I'm, my thesis advisor, I'm been doing astronomy now 45 years I'm almost 70 once told me that the most astronomers for their their whole life just redo their thesis Mm -hmm. so you know you write a thesis and you continue in the same subject well actually change subjects radically from when I was a graduate student till now but I have to say over the last 30 years I've been following pretty much the same track in astronomy cosmology so I we, we discovered dark energy we discovered how to measure accurate distances in the universe can use that to measure how fast the universe is expanding. When we started this, there were you know, two or three dozen astronomers working in this field. Now there are thousands. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's kind of like I enjoyed it when I worked in a small group. I don't enjoy it when I'm part of a paper with 3,000 people on it, which right. I am in one case. I, I, don't know, I don't know who all these people are. Um, so I want to go back to the way I used to do science, which is kind of the old person's way now, with the smaller groups. So many of my collaborators that are really close, we kind of um, disattached ourselves from the chasing after the big picture, which is measuring more and more accurately the expansion and the acceleration of the universe. Those are great subjects, but but so we're stepping back and looking at, at, at 
the calibrations that we did to get to this point to see if there's something in what we have done that was wrong or can be improved upon. Right. So it's it's not as exciting as saying we're discovering a new force of nature or we're seeing we discovered that dark energy changes over time. But for me it's it's the type of science I want to do. I mean I like the data and so it's so we're studying the properties of exploding stars to make them more accurate to measure distances into the universe. Wow. Have you come across uh, gravitational waves with the exploding stars? Do you know anything about? Yeah, well, that was the 3,000 author paper I was on, the, uh, the, the first gravitational wave detection. That's an incredible dis discovery. Those, th that just totally blew me away, that discovery. There, a friend of mine at Caltech, as a postdoc, I was a postdoc there at Mount Wilson, he was at Caltech, he started working on this this 40 some odd years ago and that's the only project he worked on was building part of this machine and he retired and two months after he retired they discovered gravitational waves he was wow. part of that discovery but he devoted his whole scientific life wow. to the discovery of, of gravitational waves because the detectors that they originally built w couldn't measure gravitational waves they were orders of magnitude too noisy and so people didn't believe that they could do this, but certain people kept on it and you know, large teams of physicists, and they improved the technique and they finally discovered these waves of, of gravitational time and space that are, that are variable when, when two very massive objects interact. In, <coughs> excuse me, interact. So yeah, gravitational waves are, are amazing. You can see black holes colliding, you can see all sorts of wow. weird stuff. They're gonna launch, um, a satellite called LISA, which is a laser interferometric satellite where they're going to put, I think, three satellites essentially in an equilateral triangle in an orbit that's, I believe, following the Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. And with this, uh, this new gravitational wave satellite, they'll be able to detect, they'll be much more sensitive to other types of gravitational waves. And so we're, in a way, we're looking at the universe we always looked at the universe using light in some mm -hmm. fashion. Um, we can see the universe a little bit through a particle called a neutrino, but neutrinos don't interact with us, so we only could vaguely see the universe. But with gravitational waves, we're looking at pure gravitation. And so we're looking at the universe with a completely different set of eyes. And so that's, whenever we do that in astronomy, amazing new discoveries happen. Sure. And so we're right we're just beginning this with the gravitational waves, the detectors. There are three of them now. There's going to be a fourth one online, and then Lisa is going to be launched. So it's 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 expanding rapidly now that the technology has been proved. I mean, they're they're measuring variations of a of a hundredth of a proton as well, space wow. space ripples through this machine. A hundredth of a proton. Um, the sensitivity. I mean, you know, everything yeah, is vib vibrating. Right. And right. And yet you have to calm all of that stuff down and measure that precision. And they did it. <laughs> and they that won the Nobel Prize. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, I bet they did. They deserve it after that. And you had another question about a, an asteroid or something like that? What was that? Oh, yeah. I wanted yeah, to I wanted, know I, if you heard this about this. Was, I was interested in this when he mentioned it. I was like, yeah, we, we got to hit him with this. <laughs> so I didn't see it on super credible uh, news sources. So mm -hmm. let me know if yeah, it's could completely be, could bullied. Not be. Um, but there is a alien meteor that hit the earth in 2014 something like that and then 2017 we saw the i don't know how to pronounce it but the oh a mile mile <laughs> that mm -hmm. one um and then Could there you is pronounce it again <laughs> Omu no i can't Omu -omu -a. <laughs> Omu -omu -a? Oh, is it? Omu -omu -a. that must okay. be a hawaiian <laughs> word huh yeah. yeah okay and then someone named dr siraj wanted to retrieve fragments of the meteor because they I guess they recently discovered that it might be from outside of our solar system. Mm -hmm. Do you know if we've made any progress on that or? I don't know if anything has been dis been discovered. There, there's, a, there's a lot of backstory to this. So okay. um, we used to think we were really isolated in our solar system. Like, you know, we're really far away from any nearby star. So the idea that something from another star could actually come and hit us just didn't seem like it was ever going to happen. And yet then in 2017 or whatever the year was, Oumuamua was discovered, and it clearly came from outside the solar system. It came in way too fast because 
Wow. If it comes in really fast, we know that it had to have come from outside our solar system because it's mm -hmm. coming in faster than the gravity of the sun would allow if it was just in the solar system. So that was really weird. So and was this large? Was it small? It Do was pretty large. I okay. forget what it is, you know, hundreds of meters across and a kilometer across. Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't recall yeah, what it is. Yeah, that's big. But the problem was we it was discovered as it was leaving, and so we don't have a really good orbit for it. But they got a good enough velocity to show that it almost certainly didn't come from the solar system. And immediately there was an, an astronomer at Harvard, Avi Loeb, who was the chairman of the astronomy department, that said, it's an alien spacecraft. And it's like, <laughs> that's and all you guys need here. like like <laughs> you confirm yeah. that. it's like it could be but it's unlikely and and so he he's kept at it he's got a whole bunch of um silicon valley types donate money to something called the galileo project okay which i think i've heard of that actually yeah. yeah which is a cool project they're going to build telescopes and look at stuff that's coming in mm -hmm. so there's good science behind it the bad science is saying it's aliens, although it could be, but just it's unlikely. So one of the things was like, okay, well, this thing, we've never seen anything like this before. It's really weird, so maybe it's aliens. And But then two years later, another one comes at us. And this one we have a really good orbit for. And it's clearly just something from another star. We don't know what star okay. it is, but it came in and left. So, so these things aren't rare. So now we know they're not rare. So now people are going back and looking, well, we have all sorts of data on on meteors that have crashed into the Earth, meteorites, um, and we know some of, the, some of the orbits pretty well from from radar, also from cell cell phones. People take pictures of like Chelyabinsk, and you can actually from putting together all of the pictures and the timestamps, you can figure out what the orbit was. Mm -hmm. So we know where the Chelyabinsk meteor came from. So now they're looking at, at the historical records of things that came in, and some of them look like they could have had velocities that were faster than you would expect for something in the solar system. And so that's what you're talking about, is there is a claim that there, is, there are a couple of them. There, the, the big news came out a couple of days ago that there was a meteor that clearly, for them, had a velocity that was too high. There are now astronomers that are, are saying that's not true, that the person didn't do the mathematics correctly. I don't know. I'm not, it's not my field. But it is true that these things are a lot more common. So we actually do have pieces of things from outside the solar system, but they're not big. They're little pieces of dust. So a couple tons of dust rain down on the Earth every day. And it's been when they've, they've looked through you know, hundreds of thousands of these little pieces of dust called Brownlee particles. And they found that some of them have a, an, a relative abundance of the elements. You know, the amount of iron to calcium to titanium that could not have happened in our solar system. So they know they come from outside the solar system. Hmm. And now they've discovered a, a cool way of <clears throat> getting a lot of this dust. It used to be you'd fly airplanes really high and you'd gather it or you'd do satellites. Well, a guy in Finland, I believe it was Finland, discovered you could find it on roofs. And they have, wow. they have metal roofs for the snow and the ice. Mm -hmm. And so during the wintertime, the the dust settles on it and so when if you take the the water or the the snow and you just sift through it you can find space dust and he was an amateur and he discovered he could get more space dust than almost anyone else by looking at roofs wow and with these simple yeah simple yeah. And so yeah. you could find pieces of material that came from other stars whether it's a whole meteor or not that'll be really interesting since it seems like this is not an uncommon thing to happen. I would think sooner or later, yeah, someone's going to have. I mean, we find meteors from Mars, probably, mm -hmm. sir, probably from Venus, although that's more controversial. But we have meteors from Mars, so yeah, I think sooner or later that discovery is going to be made. Do you think anything will come of it? Oh, we'll we'll understand. We'll understand the in greater detail what other solar systems are made of. That'll tell us something. Okay. It's not going to be revolutionary. What's okay. <laughs> revolutionary is that things can travel between the stars, and so life can hitchhike between stars, right? If this can happen. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. yeah that's and so, so you'll look in these meteors for meteorites. Excuse me. Meteors when it's up in the sky, meteorite when it hits the ground. Okay. Um, they'll look for signs of life, 
and some meteors have amino acids in them, but um, there's no sign that those amino, amino acids were, any, were part of life at any time. They just form naturally in the interstellar space that those elements got together and just formed an amino acid. Okay. All right, so one last thing, and i got to bring it up because it's the biggest thing on the Internet as far as UFOs and all that are concerned. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts on what you thought the Tic Tac thing is with with uh, Lieutenant Fravor and, and that whole video. Uh, pretty damning when you look at it. It's kind of convincing, but it could, you know, I, I'm a layman. I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> so, I mean, give me an idea of what your thoughts are on, on something like that. You know, and, and also... It, the, the incredible thing is when they were talking about, you know, it, it went from, I think, one foot to 80,000 feet in 0.2 seconds or something like that. And we don't know of anything that can travel like that at this point. And, uh, and then another description was throwing a, uh, a ping pong ball in a glass and shaking it around. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, it had that same type of movement. So any ideas on what that could be? Or do you think it's actually alien from another... From another place or and I know you probably have limited information on it as well so yeah but I can't tell you about it <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah we have a body frozen no no awesome. uh, <laughs> um, how can I preface this there's a difference between being excited by something and letting your imagination come up with an explanation which could be true so okay be, and actual physical evidence and the physical evidence is still kind of crappy images. <laughs> yeah, it's always and a bad image. It's I never had a lot like the the Bigfoot thing. Yeah. It's always a grainy. Yeah. You know, you get to <laughs> see his butt, feet, and that's yeah. it. I mean, what's the deal with that? Now, one so. of the image, one of the three videos that was released, um, which where you saw a little spot over the ocean, right? That is in focus, and so you actually can measure that. You can. They have a distance to it, and it's something that looks like it's about ten thousand feet. It could be a bird. Okay. Um, but what you're talking about is it's the typical UFO image where it's like kind of out of focus. You can't really see anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I'm being facetious. You can't see the pilot's head or lights or anything. It's just this kind of fuzzed out blob from probably, I think it's an infrared camera. Yeah, I think it is an IR camera. So it's intriguing. But in science, we require a higher level of evidence, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so you can come up with various theories about what it is, and one of them is that it's something alien. But in the past, so many things like this have appeared and ultimately have not been aliens. Mm -hmm. That, um, that I, I hold my, my, as a scientist, I hold my judgment back. I can't explain it away. There are actually some interesting explanations. Gimbling for instance, mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the camera. But having used infrared detectors in my life, when you look at it, something through the infrared, it doesn't look like anything normal. So right. you don't have your own experience of what is normal when you look through an infrared camera. Now, these are Navy pilots, so these are really well-trained people. But they're looking at the sky through a technology that it's foreign to human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I can't explain it. I can't, I can't say whether the telemetry is right or not. Um, it's fascinating, but it's not enough evidence in science for us to say that's an alien UFO. It'd be cool. I mean, I, people seem, seem to think that astronomers don't want there to be UFOs. Mm -hmm. we, we actually want information like that. We're interested. We want to find intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, no matter where it is. Sure. And so, you know, I have friends that are have built their own little observatories, retired astronomers looking for uh, signs of alien life. Um, you can't get money from the government to do it. You know, mm -hmm. Go to Congress and say, I want to find aliens. They're not going to give you money, but there are a lot of rich people in Silicon Valley that will give you money, like the Galileo Project. So astronomers are actively looking for, for crazy, crazy signs of life, but we would love to find it. But the data that's given to us in a video like that is not sufficient for us to be able to do anything with. Right. So I can't explain it away, which means that it's it's intriguing and interesting. But my level of requirement for understanding something that I see is higher than, has to be higher in doing science. 
Sure. And and it, and it's not reached that that particular level of accuracy. We have there's there's one guy. I don't know if you read about this, a professor of something or other at Stanford University, who somehow claims to have three pieces of some sort of alien spacecraft. Yeah, they, I have read about that actually. Yeah. And I don't remember his name, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I wish that he would let someone else look at these things. Mm -hmm. and the fact he's not letting them look at them right. is weird. He, I think one of the claims was that, that one of the pieces is made from a pure isotope of magnesium. Magnesium has three different isotopes, three different weights of magnesium. Mm -hmm. One is dominant, the other two are very rare. But any magnesium you have, you'll always have the mixture of those those rare isotopes. Right. I think his claim was that there's no evidence of those isotopes. If that's the case, that is really weird because why would why would you do that? There's no reason to get rid of those other isotopes. If you're gonna build something out of magnesium, mm -hmm. you use magnesium here on Earth. We don't need a technology that has pure magnesium. So if you had a piece of something that was a pure isotope, that is a physical piece of evidence that is hard to explain other than a technology we don't have. Right. So we need more evidence like that. But he's not letting he's not showing it to anyone and almost no one else has any sign of physical evidence. I've had people when I lived in Chile, people would, would say, I've got a piece of a UFO, I'll sell it to you for a million dollars. Literally. I mean this Really? Is, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, okay, um, can, can you show it to me? No, 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 no. no. you got to buy it first. It's yeah. like, oh, pay up front. Yeah, pay up front. <laughs> um, I've got some pretty cool stuff, by the way. So. <laughs> so, so, but we need physical evidence and we need in focus images of mm -hmm. things. And when we get that, then it'll pass, for me as a scientist, the level of, or uh, pass a level of ability to show that this is something mm -hmm. truly strange and cannot be explained easily by anything here on Earth. And I often wonder if we're just not supposed to know. You know, just like, for instance, life after death. You know, no one's ever been able to prove anything. No one's ever come back from death, at least not death for an extended period. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it's just one of those things we're just not supposed to know. Well, I did meet an alien yeah. once. Really? Yeah, I did. And I mean, literally, I mean... So I'm. Okay. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> so I, I, what you got? I can't. I, that's so going to be great. I'm, I'm. I'm. I fly into Santa Barbara. I have a meeting, and I'm <clears> going to leave Santa Barbara, come back to College Station. I have to get the 6 a.m. flight or what, the early, earliest morning flight. Santa Barbara is a very small airport, so mm -hmm. I get to the airport, and I and I go through um, the security, and there's one guy dressed in a suit who's right behind me. And so I go into the the waiting area, and there's all these chairs. No one else is there. I sit down. This guy sits down right next to me. It's like, it's like, okay, <laughs> this is kind of weird. Yeah. And he looks at me, and, and I have a computer which has the NASA meatball on it, the NASA symbol, okay. the blue one. Right. And he says, you're from NASA. I said, well, no, but I get government grants from NASA. He said, okay, I'm an alien. It's like, what? It's like, I'm thinking, like, you're from another country. It's like, I'm an alien. Okay. Um, yeah. He said, I want you to tell NASA something. Can you tell NASA something from me? Uh, okay. He said, I'm from Mars, and I'm an alien, and there are bad aliens on, this, on the space shuttle. No, it's not space shuttle, the International Space Station. It's like, okay, so I'm not going to keep the conversation going, but clearly he's <laughs> going to keep it going. Right. And so how do you, so he explains how he knows, is that he's, he's from Mars, and if you're from Mars, you can see some colors that you can't see as human beings. And so when he looks at a video of what's in the space station, he sees that there are some people with the wrong color. There are two colors, the good, good color and the bad color. Okay. And there are some people with the bad co color on the International Space Station, and he knows their names, and he wants me to tell NASA about the fact that you should do something about this. And it goes on and on. We get on the airplane, and that was it. And the guy looked normal. I mean, he looked like he was going to sell cars or something, you know, with those nice suits right. and everything. So... Here it is, I've met an alien, a person who, now, I don't think they were putting me on, but maybe they were, but why mm -hmm. would they go through this, this whole theater at 6 a.m. in the morning in Santa Barbara Airport? So I have physical evidence that I met, or I have evidence that I met an alien, mm -hmm. but do I believe he was an alien? It's like, no. Um, first of all, if you see colors that no one else can see, how come it comes across on a television? Because <laughs> the television was made to see our colors, <laughs> right? So there are all sorts of things that jump to my mind. But so that's the that's the problem with this evidence is that 
people can say things, and they could be right. I can't prove that this guy wasn't from Mars. It seems mm-hmm. really unlikely. So, you know, I have this story, which I always tell people, but I want to say that I'll always have that story. I'm always going to remember that as some something I don't believe is, is true. I think he was schizophrenic or something. Right. But at least he was a real person telling me this, that he was from another planet. And, and if I was interested in doing something, I could actually talk more with him. We could have him look, do biological tests, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Here was a physical piece of evidence, and we need more of that with UFOs. Gotcha. <laughs> well, that makes sense. All right, Alex, you got anything else? or Do you think we'll ever travel faster than light? Do you think that's even possible? At, at this point, I don't know how we could do it. The, the, the problem with going faster than travel, traveling faster than light is, again, the problem of time. So maybe if you could fall into a wormhole, a, a, a black hole that connects with another part of the universe, then you would be traveling in time. But then you have, still have the problem that, that time slows down and you can actually then go back and see you entering the, the portal, which goes, you go backward in time. So you end up having, you know, versions of yourself all walking into the black, this, this portal or something. At an infinite the number, actually. Yeah, an infinite number. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't look like we can travel in time, but maybe we can. Uh, I don't want, to, I don't want to discount that. There's no, there's no simple law of physics that says no, no, you can't do this. But the, when people think about how to do it, they always come up with a contradiction. But that's right now. Maybe in the future we'll know a little bit more about our physics and maybe there will be a, a way of getting around it. I don't see that at this point. And all the avenues in that direction have always been clear, quickly shown to be wrong. But it would be kind of cool, except you don't want to back, go backwards in time. You only want to go forward because if you go backwards in time, you can kill your grandfather, right? Right. That's not good. <laughs> That's yeah. not good. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good at all. <laughs> well, Dr. Sons, if I appreciate you coming, I know that it was quite a drive for you to get out here. And uh, we did work for quite some time to get you here, too. And this has been a great conversation. I knew it was going to be. I loved it. It's a fascinating field of study. And, uh, man, I learned so much. And now I've got a couple of things that i got to go check out even more. One's a movie and one's a poet. So that's something I'm (laughs) definitely going to get into. Um, I hope that maybe we can do this again sometime in the future. Absolutely. And I'm going to do some more research, too, and try to get a better understanding of a lot of this kind of stuff. It's, It's a... It's a little hard for an older guy, you know. Um, Can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I'm still trying anyway. Um, Again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been great. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. For Alex Brow, I'm Hank Vatt. This is Hank's Think Tank, and looks like we're gone.